You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from UChicago's Becker Friedman Institute. Welcome to the first Becker Brown Bag of the Year. I'm Tova Levin. I'm the Assistant Director of the Price Theory Initiative at the Becker Freeman Institute. We're really excited to have Professor Pope speak to us today. He has been on faculty at Booth since 2010, and he studies the intersection between psychology and economics, focusing much of it on the underlying theories that predict human behavior, finding oftentimes that Individuals, including experts, deviate from economically rational predictions. And today he's going to speak to us about auctions, specifically the effect of auctioneers on auction outcomes. So thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. So I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, looking forward to your feedback and a, and a discussion about auctions. All right. So, uh, auctions are pretty cool. I'm a kind of a fan of auctions these days. Uh, many of you probably have had experiences with auctions uh, potentially before coming to the MBA program. So, so we see auctions in lots of places, right? So many of these you're familiar with, things like spectrum auctions, cattle auctions, uh, antiques, lumber, art, uh, real estate, right? We see this all over in uh, ads on, online. eBay, of course, is, is an auction framework, uh, in, uh, at least it used to be more and, and still is in a lot of ways. Um, so, so auctions are important. They're obviously in lots of places. Today I want to talk about one particular auction environment that maybe many of you don't know very well. Uh, but if you get one thing from this talk, at least you'll learn about a cool new environment, right? And that is wholesale car auctions. Has anyone ever worked in the wholesale car auction industry? All right, so we got a couple. So, so you'll have to keep me honest here. Um, but, but this is a really cool market, all right? So let me explain this market for those that aren't uh, selling their cars in wholesale auctions very often. Uh, so what happens is, is car dealers, so say you own a new car company, uh, maybe you're selling, you, you, you sell new Hondas. Uh, one thing that you often do for people that come in to buy a car is you'll accept their old car as a trade-in. And so you get all these trade-ins coming in and what do you do with these cars? You don't want to sell a, a used Toyota on your new Honda lot. And you're getting all these trades. So a convenient way to get rid of these cars is to take them to a wholesale auction market. Right? So, uh, so that's one primary source. You also have rental car companies and fleet lease companies and things that will bring their cars. But these cars will come into the auction. And this is now where I'm going to study today. This is what we're going to be talking about. They come, so you drive the cars or have someone drive them or put them on trucks, and they arrive at this auction house. So, so this is a Mannheim auction house. So Mannheim is one of the largest companies in this space, and they have different auction houses around the US. So they come here, and then they're auctioned off. Right? The car goes through an auction process, and the buyers at this auction, so you and I actually can't go and buy at this auction, you have to have a dealer's license to attend. So primarily, the buyers are dealers that come, they buy the cars, and then they take them back to their lots to sell to final retail customers. All right? So that's the way the market works. You have the suppliers of the cars to this wholesale auction. Here are the buyers. And, and then we have this kind of nice space uh, where the auctions occur. All right. This is pretty cool. So, there's millions and millions of cars being sold in these wholesale auctions every year. So, so we've been working with Mannheim, um, one of the, the major players in this, in this market, and they provided to us data which is really, really nice. So we have millions of transactions, millions of auctions that took place over, over a, a significant period of time. We know things about the car. Uh, we know, uh, of course, what the car sold for, whether it did sell when it went up in the auction. So we know a lot about these cars. And with this data, we can do some really cool things. So let me just show you an example of what you can do with amazing data like this. So for example, one thing that we wanted to look at is how does the mileage of a car affect its price that it sells for. All right, pretty simple, right? We're just going to look at how the price is impacted by how, uh, how much mileage the car has on it. What should this relationship look like? Yeah, it better be downward sloping, or, or everything you've learned in economics is wrong. 
right? It is indeed downward sloping. So you see a nice kind of downward sloping, uh, you know, decay of capital. But here's what we found particularly interesting is that at every 10,000 mile mark, you see about a 200 to a $300 drop in value for cars that just cross over a threshold. So a car that has, say, 79,000 miles on it sells for about $200 more than a car that has 80,000 miles on it. Right? And in fact, it's even cooler than that. If you, because there's millions of observations here, you can blow up on this. And you can see that every, at every 1,000 mile mark, you get small discontinuity. So when a car crosses from being, say, 48,900 miles to 49,000, it experiences a drop in value. And then it experiences larger drops in values whenever it crosses over a 10,000 mile threshold. Right, so this is a paper that some co-authors and I worked on uh, that we were looking at what we call this left digit bias. It's similar to why a store might price at $5.99. And we can explore how this kind of ripples through the market and affects retail customers and who's biased in these situations and, and whether you can take advantage in arbitrage. So we can, we can look at lots of cool things. But it all starts with this neat environment with lots and lots of great data. All right. So, but this isn't the number one thing I want to talk to you about today. What I want to talk to you about is, is something that happened when we started visiting, when we, when we visited uh, this, this particular Mannheim auction. You walk in, and there's one thing that just catches your attention immediately, and that is the auctioneers, right? So by far, this is, we, we walked in and, and we're, you know, we're just stunned by what is actually going on. We didn't know what was going on. We thought we had entered some circus area or something. It was, it was, it was really crazy, right? These auctions have multiple auctioneers auctioning things off at the same time when they're coming through different lanes. Um, and so I want to talk to you about that because I think it's pretty cool. So let me start. I'm going to show you a, a short video so you're all familiar with exactly how this works. All right? So a car. A car is auctioned off on average in these markets in about a minute and 20 seconds. So they're moving them through, right? A car is, it comes through this lane. There's an auctioneer sitting up on the auction block. And they're auctioning it off. And they'll do it. And before they're even finished, the next car will start rolling in. And all of these buyers are kind of milling around bidding. Uh, and they start on the next auction. So they'll auction these off consecutively. Each lane will auction off two to 300 cars a day, right, as they're moving through. All right, so let me show you an example of what this is like. All right, let's pause for one second. All right, so, so this is clearly the auctioneer. Hopefully you were able to figure that out. The guy sitting next to him is the owner of the car, right? So this is the person who brought the car in. He could be an agent of, say, the new car company who took it in as a trade-in. So he brings the car in. His job is just to sit there. And the auctioneer is going to try to get the best price they can. And then they're going to turn over to the seller or to the owner and ask if that's good enough. And the owner has the chance to say, yes, I'm happy with that price, or no. Right? So they have, a, they have a reserve price that they are able to set. Um, and they can accept the price that gets uh, uh, the highest uh, bid if they want to or they don't have to. All right, so now he's starting to auction. Uh, did you hear his first price he called out? It's a little tricky. He said a couple of things first. He said, he said, he said title's in, green light's on. Right? This is essentially just saying like everything's in order, all the paperwork's ready to go, and then he starts. So he's not really talking about the car except just like, all right, here we get going. And then he called out a price of $26,000. Right? So this is what's called a fish price. The fish price is the first price that an auctioneer will call out. So he calls out $26,000, and so far he's getting no takers. All right, so let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so he started at 26 was his fish price. He went down 24, 23, 22, 19. He goes all the way down to 19, a bid comes in. So now he's moving back up. I think he's at 21.9 or something was the last call. 
right? Now, there's this, you might have seen this guy that kind of came into picture of the view for a minute. This is called the ring man. So his job um, is to just aid the auctioneer, right? So his job is to kind of, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what, these, what, these, uh, what the real skill here is, but, but it's partly to kind of get the crowd excited, but it's also to spot bidders. So he's helping the auctioneer. Every time he goes, yeah, hey, uh, that means he saw a bid come in at the price that was being auctioned. So it helps the auctioneer knows, know when bids are coming in. Does that make sense? All right, so let's finish up the auction now. So, so what it ended up selling for 24/7, right? So it started at 26, went down to 19, came back up to 24/7. It ended up selling. He turned to the to the owner of the car. The owner said sold, right? So he yells out sold, right? He could have yelled out no, no sell, right? All right. So that's how one of these auction runs. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of cool. Let me explain why we were so captivated by this. So other than that it's just kind of this amazing spectacle that we don't see every day, um, what's, what's interesting is the auction theory, in terms of how academics have studied it, pretty much leaves the auctioneers out completely. Right? So, so auction theory uh, in, in academics is largely focused on, on what I'm going to call auction design. Right? So there's a lot of discussion in auction theory, and rightly so, on how an auction is structured. Is it a first or a second price auction? Is it a, is a sealed bid or, or, or is it open? Or um, uh, are, the, are the values correlated or common or private? How many bidders are there? So the structure of the auction itself matters a lot. And we're able to calculate theorems about welfare and uh, revenue generation based on, uh, based on kind of what the structure of the auction is like. What hasn't been studied nearly as much is what we're calling auction process, right? And this is conditional on the structure of the auction, right? What is kind of how the auction is run, right? The auction process we're thinking about is how do you actually run the auction, the, very, the mechanics of it, things that an auctioneer might impact. So for example, the starting value, or how quickly does the auction go, or you know, do these chance matter, the different chance, or the pace of price adjustment. Right? Are they moving up in large increments or small increments? How much, uh, how much is the visibility in the room mattering, right? of, of having this ring man calling out and pointing to people and getting in their face a little bit? Right? How much does that matter? This is all auction process. Right? And our theory doesn't give a lot of work, uh, doesn't have a lot to say about this. It's kind of the basic uh, theory in, uh, in auction theory essentially assumes away an auctioneer. Right, so when Milgram and Weber modeled English auctions, these oral ascending auctions, uh, they modeled them that everyone in the room came in and they had their fingers on a button and the price starts at zero and then rises continuously and then when you're done you let go of your button. The last person that holds down their button wins. So that's the way the model was just kind of set up. And of course we want to have models that are simplified because they're going to make uh, testing uh, uh, and, and, and coming up with theorems and, and proofs more, uh, more simple. Um, but it maybe leaves out a very important aspect of the auction process. Because clearly prices aren't starting at zero and rising continuously and there's other stuff going on here. All right? So this is what we want to explore. Is what is it about the auctioneers that we could possibly think of as being important in our theories? Um, now, what's interesting is when we talked to the management at Mannheim, um, the, the first, we kind of blew it, I think. Well, I don't know we blew it. But uh, when we were first talking to them, we said, you know, we're really interested in these auctioneers, right? And I, and, and I said, I remember saying to, to the general manager, uh, I said, you know what, our economic theory suggests that auctioneers maybe don't matter all that much, right? I said, you know, it's, our, our theory suggests that I should be able to stand up on the block and auction off a car as well as an auctioneer. I mean, people have some willingness to pay, right? They're rational, they're going to bid their willingness to pay, 
So who, can, who, who, why does it matter who's calling out the price? And he just laughed, <laughs> right? He's like, oh, well, uh, you know, that's great if that's what auction theory says, but I don't give a dang what auction theory says, that's, uh, right? So he thought that was ludicrous. What do, you, he's, what do you mean the auctioneers don't matter, right? He said, we have superstar auctioneers. We pay these guys a lot of money. They go to auctioneering school, right? They go to auctioneering college. They have contests. They're, they're, there's auctioneer championships, right? They're like, what do you mean the like, auctioneers don't matter? Right? So there's this, there was a bit of this disconnect, at least from us, having been uh, familiarized a bit with the auction theory literature and then looking at it in practice. All right? So this is what started this project. And we wanted to know, OK, do these auctioneers matter? And why do they matter? Right? What could make a good auctioneer? All right? So the first step that we wanted to think about was somehow measuring whether good auctioneers uh, were different than, than bad, whether there were good auctioneers and bad auctioneers. We wanted to see if an auctioneer could have a systematic impact on the outcome of an auction. All right? We wanted to just kind of know whether or not they seemed to matter. So here's what we did. We, the outcome that we were interested in studying was when you talk to the auction, uh, uh, the, the management of the auction, the outcome that they care most about, we talked a lot to them about what do you want from your auctioneers. And it's very clear. They want the cars to sell. It's all about probability. It's the, they call it conversion rate. They want a high conversion rate. Right? That's how they make their money. Right? Their fees come when a car sells. Whenever there's a transaction, they get a fee from both parties. All right? And so they talk about conversion. We talked other, about other things. Well, do you want your auctioneer to go fast? Do you want them to get through a lot of cars? Or do you want them to just get really high prices? And they said, well, we care about these other things to the extent that they get sales. We care if it helps them get a good conversion rate, but we care about conversion rate. Right? They think of themselves as kind of a stock market. It doesn't matter if prices are high or low. As long as there's volume, they're doing just fine. Right? Um, so, so I'm going to show you evidence based primarily on conversion rates uh, for this talk. We did explore other outcomes that could make a good auctioneer or a bad auctioneer, things like price and speed and other things. And it ends up that the good auctioneers are good on all of these dimensions. Um, but I'm going to show you the dimension of conversion rate, or this probability of sell. All right. Um, so how do you actually study whether certain auctioneers are better at this than others? The first, I think, kind of very basic or perhaps even naive way to do it would be to simply calculate, you could do this in, in any statistical program, the average conversion rate of auctioneers. Right? On average, how many cars do they sell that they, that they auction off? And so we can do that. So, so now I'm, I'm looking here at, we look at Mannheim, Pennsylvania, which is the largest auction house that Mannheim runs. They have 60 essentially full-time auctioneers that auctioned off a, a large number of cars during our sample period. And what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you their performance, and I'm going to rank them from the, the worst auctioneer, based on some metric, uh, to the best auctioneer. All right? I'm, we're going to look at how much variation there is in, in their performance measures. All right, so the first thing we do is we simply look at how well do they do in the probability of sell measure relative to average. Right? Now, on average, uh, the cars in our, in our data set, we're, we're looking at dealer cars, they're selling about 55% of the time. So a lot of cars don't sell. It's not like all cars sell. A lot of them don't. Right? And so that's the average. And if you look at the worst and the best auctioneers, you see that there's a lot of variation in the sales they're able to get. It looks like the best auctioneer is selling about 15 percentage points more cars than the average auctioneer. Right? So rather than maybe a 55% sales rate, they're selling at 70%. Right? That's enormous. Right? That's a really big, and the worst auctioneer is maybe about 15 percentage points worse than average. All right? so, so why is this naive? Why might we be worried about these basic stats? We talked to the manager and we said, oh, you know, have you thought about trying to come up with an objective measurement of your, of your auctioneers? And, and his response was, well, yeah, I mean, we kind of looked at their kind of raw, their kind of how many cars they sell and things. He said, but we're worried about that. And there was one thing he was really, really worried about. And that is, is the cars aren't perfectly randomly assigned to auctioneers. Right? So in some ways they are. Most cars come in and they kind of get randomly assigned to different lanes and then auctioneers just take over a lane and they auction cars and they, they rotate around and things. So there's a lot of randomness, but it's not perfect. 
For example, he, he mentioned that certain sellers, some of their really big volume sellers, uh, get some special, special treatment. They can actually even request an auctioneer sometimes. Uh, they, they discourage this, but they can, right? They've got, they've got enough sway that they can do it. And so what happens is if you have certain sellers that, are, that, are, uh, that always sell their cars, let's say they set really low reservation prices, and those sellers are consistently matched up with a particular auctioneer, that auctioneer might look incredible, but it's not the auctioneer, it's the sellers that got matched with him. It's the type of cars that they got auctioned with. Right? And so, so the general manager here was, was saying, you know, that's, you know, that's the problem we have is we just, we haven't kind of randomly assigned cars to auctioneers. And so we explained that there are statistical approaches to try to help with this, right? So specifically those that are familiar, you probably maybe all know this, uh, right? You can run these statistical models where you control for, say, a seller fixed effect. So you're netting out any impact that a lenient seller can have on the auction process and identifying just the auctioneer coefficients, right? So you're able to separately identify seller and auctioneer effects, right? And you can identify other, you can, you can control for car types, right? So maybe certain types of cars get sold more. For some reason, certain auctioneers got certain types of cars, right? You can control for day of the week effects. Maybe certain auctioneers work certain days when, when cars sell better or something. You can control for all types of things, the lane that they're on, all types of things. Right? And this is clearly going to mitigate the amount of variation that we see. Right? Because anytime there's kind of this random, non-random assignment, some auctioneers are going to get lucky and some auctioneers are going to get unlucky relative to just a random process. So we should expect some of this variation in skill to diminish. All right? Now, uh, uh, the management was really excited to hear about this type of stuff. Right? In fact, they're, they've been super awesome throughout this whole process. Um, and, and they're excited about this type of work too, right? I mean, in fact, they, uh, recently they, they based some of their pay increases on our rankings of their auctioneers, right? So they're really excited about how do they measure performance. And so, so what happened, let me show you though what happens when you uh, control for various things. So we, we have, I'm gonna kind of uh, skim through a lot of this, but we can run various different models. And so the, this is each a different type of model uh, that we're running. And it, the most conservative model that we have is one where a lot of the variation goes away and you're left with about the worst auctioneers are auctioning about three percentage points worse than average and the best auctioneers maybe you know, four to five percentage points more than average. So the best to the worst auctioneers, there's a difference in conversion rate of, of somewhere around six percentage points. All right, now that's still pretty big. Right? You can calculate uh, what, that, what that translates to in terms of fees. It's a pretty big deal. Um, but but that's, the, that's, that's our best guess as to what the variation in skill in the outcomes that they're able to achieve is based on this data. Now we do lots of other things. We identify, for example, off of shift changes. So there's, you know, we, we devote a lot of work uh, uh, in the paper and, and elsewhere to making sure we're identifying real variation uh, that, that we trust. Um, but this is the variation we find. So how do we know that these estimates, these objective measures of auctioneer rankings are believable? What are some ways that we might think about kind of getting a sense for whether they're, they're, they're saying anything about reality? Let me propose one. So if some auctioneers are really just good, we would expect that they're good consistently. Right? We'd expect these effects to be pretty robust across time. Now, some auctioneers might improve or some auctioneers might get worse, but we'd hope that these, uh, these ability characteristics are somewhat stable. Right? So you could do, for example, a cut across time. So, so we do that. Uh, here's an example. So here's our 60 auctioneers. Um, these are people that had good auctioneer scores, so they were, say, four percentage points better than average in the latter half of the data. And these were the auctioneers that had good scores in the early part of the data. And lo and behold, yeah, they do kind of match up. Those that were good early on were also good later on in the data. It does look like there's something stable about these scores uh, over time. Now, it's not perfect, which suggests either some auctioneers are getting worse or better relative to average, or that there's some noise in our measurement, and we can estimate how much of this uh, uh, lack of fit is due to noise 
uh, based on our standard errors for each, each auction year coefficient and things. So you can do various things. But it ends up that you get a pretty strong correlation across time in terms of these auction year effects. All right, there's other things. What, anyone thought of another one of how we could think about whether or not these, these, auctioneer, fixed, these uh, auctioneer ability measures are kind of making sense? Now that I've given you time to think. Uh, you can simply validate uh, okay, the new data set. So you, you, you pick a good performer versus a not so good performer for your ranking, and then you screen drive it across uh, to their options and watch them all one. Yeah, okay, so this is the gold standard, right? Here's what we would love to do, is go in and run a field experiment, right? This is what the Becker, is, this is what the Becker group really knows how to do, right? They could go in there and like bust this out in a week. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so, so you come in and you could randomly assign cars. So maybe you're worried about our identification in some way, and, and that would be awesome. And that's actually something that we're kind of in discussions with, that we might think about trying to do with this, uh, with this company. It's a lot, of, it's some work. Uh, they have to kind of think hard about whether they're willing to do that. What happens if someone comes in and requests a certain auctioneer where we were planning on randomly assigning them out that day? Uh, so there's some issues that one has to think about. But yeah, that would be a gold standard. Uh, let me suggest one other thing. So before we delivered these auctioneer rankings to the company, so they knew that we were running these objective measures of auctioneer performance, but they hadn't seen any of our results yet. We asked them to rank their own auctioneers, right, based on subjective evaluations. So we said, we want to, you, please give us a list of who you think are good. And we wanted to get a sense of whether our objective auctioneer uh, rankings correlate with their more subjective measures. I mean, subjective in a sense, but, but very objective in other ways, right? They're able to watch these people every day of the week. Uh, we wanted to see if there was correlation here, right? So let me show you another correlation plot. So this is our estimates of how good the auctioneers are. So here are good auctioneers, there are bad auctioneers. And on the vertical axis, we've written down the subjective evaluations. Right, so they ranked their auctioneers from, a, from zero to one. And again, you see a pretty strong correlation between our objective rankings and who they think the good auctioneers are, right? Which is comforting. I mean, it also suggests that they, all, they can kind of, they understand this already a little bit without objective measures. Um, so you could think about, well, where, does, where do these things not match up? Who do they think are good? and we think maybe aren't quite as good. And that's where there's maybe interesting uh, kind of some synergy between these things. Now it's interesting, by the way, so they, they created a three-person panel. Uh, three of their auctioneers, kind of their senior level auctioneers, uh, got together and they were the ones that created the rankings. So the manager asked these three auctioneers to create the rankings. Uh, the three auctioneers that were on the panel, uh, I'll let you guess which dots they were. <laughs> they were the, the only three that they gave a one to. Um, now it ends up that they are pretty good, right? They're on the better end of our scale, uh, but they're not the best. There's, we, we find like three or four others that are, that are right up there with them. Uh, they're, they're pulling our line in the wrong direction. But anyway, uh, so, so yeah, so, so we have their, these more subjective rankings. So you can also look at other things. So for example, they downsized towards the end of our data period and they got rid of some of their auctioneers. So we were interested in knowing whether or not they got rid of the auctioneers that we would have gotten rid of using our objective measures, right? And so these red dots represent uh, auctioneers that left. Um, many of them were not technically fired, um, uh, but it's a little bit hard to know how many people left like super voluntarily versus, but, th but they left for some reason. Uh, and what you see is, again, our, our good auctioneers are mostly black dots, right? Most of them stayed on. Uh, and most of the people that left or were fired uh, came from the, the, the auctioneers that we thought were doing a poor job, right? And so, so you see some evidence there as well. We asked them to give us this, this three-person committee. We asked them to tell us kind of how they ranked, and, and they ended up writing down like five criteria uh, of, that they thought were important. And so they included, one was the, their chant. Um, one was... Uh, I'd have to go back and look, but one was, uh, are they good with people? Are they, are, uh, do, the, do the buyers and sellers like them? Um, are, they, are they knowledgeable about the market? Uh, so they had kind of these various criteria that they used, uh, which is kind of informative, right? It's interesting to think about what they think produces a good auctioneer. 
So, so far we kind of tried to show that there is variation in auctioneer performance, but I haven't really told you why or, or what makes a good auctioneer versus a bad auctioneer. And I'll tell you this, this is, I think this is part of now kind of a, a more ongoing research agenda to understand why, because I don't think we have a perfect handle on it yet. But we have a little bit of suggestive evidence of, of what might be going on. There, there's, you could classify mechanisms for what makes a good auctioneer into kind of different buckets. For example, there's, there's different kind of more rational, sophisticated bidder stories. Um, so that it doesn't require the bidders to be all kind of crazy. Uh, right? so, so some of these stories could just include that the auctioneer is good at persuading the seller to sell. Right? Or they're good at revealing uh, information about the cars. Right? We know that information is important. So maybe an auctioneer is like, hey, did everyone notice that flat tire? Right? Or, you know, I don't know. I mean, they could point to things. Right? Or, or hey, you guys should check out that carburetor. It's you know, top quality. I don't know anything about cars, <laughs> uh, about the car parts. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it could be that they're pointing out certain features of the car. Right? But uh, um, so, so those are kind of maybe more rational, uh, bitter explanations. There's also kind of more of this behavioral side of, of they're exploiting uh, kind of cognitive and emotional biases of the bidders, right? And they're able to, you know, to create this irrational exuberance or this auction fever. And they start to compete against each other, even though maybe they know they shouldn't be, they do, right? So this would maybe be more of a behavioral story. So which of these things is actually going on? It's very, very hard to tell with just the observational data. I think here's where field experiments and going into the lab uh, could we could learn a lot more. We do do a few things. So for example, we start with a, just a basic survey of these auctioneers, and we ask them, like, what makes a good auctioneer? Um, so, so one way that we asked, we asked them in a couple of different ways. I'll show you it in a couple of different ways. But one thing we said is, if you had to pick one of the statements below, which do you think best describes the most important role of auctioneers at your auction? Right? One, auctioneers create a sense of excitement, competition, and urgency among buyers that encourages more bidding. Our idea was there, that's kind of the behavioral story a little bit, right? It's all about creating kind of competitive arousal and excitement, right? Or auctioneers provide expert information about the cars on the block that the bidders do not know themselves. So this could be a very rational story, the auctioneers providing information. Now this one almost seems silly uh, from the very start. I mean, they auction these cars off, essentially all they do for a minute and 20 seconds is yell numbers. Um, but, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they look at, you know, maybe they do something. Uh, maybe it's that auctioneers persuade sellers to accept fair market prices. We ask if that seems to be the, uh, an important role. Or we say buyers know what a car is worth and will bid accordingly. Therefore, auctioneers do not have a large impact on auction outcomes. Uh, I'll give you a hint that the auctioneers didn't think this was the one. Um, so, so what happens? Well, you know, 31 of the 33 indicated this top one, right? That it was something about creating bitter frenzy. All right, now uh, we knew that this was going to be the answer because we had talked to so many of these auctioneers already. We, they, they talk about it and they talk about it's all about creating this excitement. So here, here's what they say. This is actually the number one thing that they seem to say, that it's, it's a lot about momentum. Right, they say the, the trick is, the, the, one, one auctioneer in particular said, all right, let me just tell you, this is, it all comes down to this. They say what you need to do is you need to, you need to get the bidding started and then you need to go as fast as you possibly can. So you, you choose increments to move up to make this go as fast as you possibly can without ever stalling out. So they said it, it, just kill, they said it kills an auction if it kind of stalls out. If you hit a number and then you have to go back down and then come back up again. So you go as fast as you, but it also kills an auction if you're like 18,000. 18,000 and one dollar. 18,000 and two, you're never gonna get to where you need to be. Right, so it's this moving fast without stalling out. And this is why they say they have this chant. It's so they can go fast, right? They need to move. It's to create excitement, but also to go quickly, right? And we do find that the auctioneers that are best in our data that we, we rank as being very good are the auctioneers that do their auctions the quickest, right? So there does seem to be something about this speed that creates urgency in the minds of the bidders. Um, all right, so, so it looks like it's primarily about this kind of creating this agitation among the bidders, but I don't think we've totally nailed that part yet. We're hoping this paper kind of opens up this, this research into auction process uh, in a way that can teach us a lot and, and we can kind of move forward uh, in a lot of ways. Let me, so, so I'm gonna wrap up here um, so that we have 10 minutes or so of, of discussion. Let me conclude though um, with, with saying 
let me first just say what we I think we've found is evidence that there are differences among auctioneers. Some auctioneers do do better than others. We've calculated and tried to identify exactly how large those effects are. And we've started to make some initial progress on what mechanisms might be driving these differences. All right? I think there's a lot of work. We've talked about some future work that needs to be done. Um, but there's a lot of really open questions in this market that I think uh, maybe are particularly interesting to a crowd like this. So for example, one is, why have not these markets moved to an online format? Right? This seems like a, a, a first order question to me in this, in this wholesale market of, of why is it that people are trucking their cars to these auction sites and then having buyers also all drive to the auction sites and then they, and yeah, they look at the cars a little bit, but it seems like you could do that online pretty well these days. And, there's, and then half of the cars don't sell and they truck them back, right, and bring them back the next week or do something else with them, right? There's a lot of inefficiency that could be gotten rid of if, it, if, if they were able to move to a more efficient format. So why is it that this hasn't happened? Well, one of the reasons uh, when you talk to, to Mannheim and others is that it's, that it's very hard to create that, that excitement in an online auction, right? Uh, that they talk about their auctioneers as being an important, such an important piece of this puzzle uh, that you just can't move that online, right? Now, is that true? They've, they've tried to explore some online options that are doing some more things right now, but that's one piece of the puzzle they haven't quite figured out. And that raises another question of um, what can you do to an online auction to improve the process, right? So if you're running, say, an online auction, let's say it's a, everyone's sitting at their computer and bidding on the same car that shows up. So it's just all virtual, but the same type of setup. Should you have an auctioneer's voice coming through the computer? Or can you do it computerized? But if you are doing it computerized, how should you set up that system? How fast should the bids come in? Right? How large of increments? Should you, should you have some underlying optimization program that's running that, that changes the bid structure? Right? Should you get to see when other people are bidding? Right? There's all types of questions that one would have to answer if one's going to move to an online auction format of this type. Um, and I think these are kind of open questions. And maybe if Mannheim or other companies can get the, the online auction system right, if they can try to reproduce what these auctioneers are doing, in an online system, they can really kind of explode in this market uh, and, and move in that direction. Right? So, so I think these are interesting questions that need to be explored. And this is why understanding what makes a good auctioneer important is because that's going to tell us how we should set up these other systems. Right? What can we learn about bidder behavior from this? Right? This is also telling us more about psychology. Right? Are really experienced dealers being affected by like, a chant that happens to be clever? I don't know. I mean, this is, we, these are more questions that kind of need to explore. And of course, I think the field experiments and laboratory experiments are one way that we can go to try to get at some of these uh, uh, more detailed questions. But lastly, before we break to question, I just want to say I think this is the type of work that there's a lot of value for, for bringing academia and industry together. Right? I think there's, there's, there's some things that we can bring to the table here, whether it be modeling or, or, or how to randomize an experiment or running field experiments or, or statistical models that we, that we can produce that can provide some value. And of course, they're providing a wealth of information. They understand how this thing works. Right? They understand what makes an effective auction. They've been doing this for years. Right? And so bringing these two skill sets together, I think, can be a very useful thing and, and something I'm pretty excited about right now. Uh, all right, so let's uh, open it up for questions. Is that all right? Or do you, do you moderate this somehow, or do I just? All right, good. All right, questions or comments? And if there are none, we can, we can break, too. Uh, have you investigated kind of the sellers uh, anywhere from kind of their interaction with the auctioneers to like how they're paid or re rewarded based on, you know, how important is conversion rate versus price for them? Because as you said, if they don't sell the car, it needs to get truck back. Yeah so, um, yeah, so mostly we've just kind of controlled for the sellers, right? We just try to kind of get them out of there and then focused on these auctioneer fixed effects. Uh, one interesting thing might be, well, why are sellers so different and how lenient they are, right? Or what are, the, what are the costs and benefits that they're thinking? I think that's a great question. So again, one that we haven't explored much. Um, uh, it could be that they have differential costs just with trucking the car back or their opportunity costs. Some of them can sell it on their lot back home 
where others just have no option to do so. Um, it could be that some sellers are also uh, uh, somewhat irrational, I, I'll be careful with that word, but are somewhat biased in what they think they can get from a car and they need to have more realistic expectations. So we've thought about field experiments where we treat the sellers by saying right before they get up on the block or something, hey, let me, let me be real clear about what you should be expecting from this auction. This is based on data over the last year for this type of car. Uh, you know, think about this before you get up there, right? And see if that makes them be more willing to sell perhaps when they actually should be. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that's a whole nother area that we haven't done much with, but could be really interesting. Yes, there, and then over there, and then back there. Do you think there'd be any value in comparing uh, prices of cars that are sold in a live auction versus similar cars that are sold on eBay? So you can tell if it's a price range. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, so these are wholesale transactions, and eBay's are, are, are primarily sell. Well, I mean, they sell to a lot of dealers, too, are on that market. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the markets are different enough. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm giving you garbage answers so far. Um, yeah, it might be interesting. I'm not exactly sure how yet or why. Um, but my prediction is that these prices are going to be a lot lower than what you're seeing on eBay uh, for the cars that sell, but, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, so here and then back there. What are your thoughts on whether or not your visual tools here apply to other markets besides used cars? So like high-end art or jewelry or anything like that? Yeah, good. Great question. So. So for those familiar with art auctions, in most art auctions, it's a very different <laughs> format, right? It's not a crazy environment as much as it's a much more uh, kind of disciplined environment, you might say. Um, so, so yeah, do a lot of these things, uh, how important are auctioneers in, in an art auction? I don't know if we have a good sense for how generalizable these effects are. Um, my guess is that uh, in a lot of auctions that are similar to this, where an auctioneer's, one of their jobs is trying to kind of get the crowd excited, that we're going to see kind of these types of effects uh, persist in these other markets. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, what is that? The storage wars or something? I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, you, situations where their 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 job is to get people excited. I think that you're going to see these effects in situations where the auctioneer is specifically asked to take a back seat and to be much uh, uh, not as much part of the show. Then maybe you don't see these auctioneer differences as much. Uh, but yeah, another good question that that would be interesting to explore. Uh, yes. Do you have the data to suggest anything with anchoring? So the in initial fish price versus the price that they go down to before bids start, and if there's any sort of relationship between where it ends, where the uh, similar to a traditional negotiation where you set the initial price, then someone comes back, and the best prediction is right in the middle. Is there any sort of data on auctions and how that works with anchoring? Yeah, great question. So uh, we have looked at anchoring some. Um, so in, the, in this main data set, the Mannheim data set, we don't have bid by bid data. So we don't have data, uh, I'm sorry, not bid by bid. Yeah, we don't have bid by bid either, but we don't have the auctions call data. So we don't know what they called out and then the next thing they called out. All we see is essentially the final price or the, the highest bid that was bid. Um, but there is another data set um, that uh, Brad Larson, who's one of the co-authors, from a different company, a competing company, that they do actually collect that data for at least a small sample. So it's a pretty small sample, but we look at it there and we see if there's certain fish prices that do better than others. So uh, what's the optimal fish price to do? Is it, uh, is it more? I mean, some, some people start lower than the car ends up selling. So they actually start with a low fish price, where other people start with uh, one conventional uh, rule of thumb, one rule of thumb would be to start at maybe 120% what you think the car is maybe going to sell for and use that as a fish and then come down and come back up. Uh, and so we looked kind of around there to see if people that started at a fish price that was really, really high did better or worse. We don't see a lot of evidence, at least in that small sample, that, that the fish price they set mattered very much. Um, now, anchoring would suggest it does, and, it, and anchoring it provides the prediction that we see in the data that they are doing this, right? Uh, so, so we think that there is something to that, uh, but the variation that you get across auctioneers doesn't appear to have very much information in terms of anchoring. Uh, but yeah, I think anchoring is actually a fairly important uh, element in this process, uh, but I don't think we have the goods to show it, except the fact that auctioneers are doing it. Here and then here and back there. I know you said you looked at a lot of other outcomes that were, many of which were correlated with, with the ones that you ended up showing us today. Yeah. But did you look at, for example, different auctioneers' ultimate selling prices for similar cars 
and whether, you know, for instance, a good auctioneer was able to get more out of the same-ish car? Yeah, excellent. So, so we did. So, so one act outcome that we looked at was price as well, both price and what we call residual price, which is the price above what the, the kind of the blue book value, uh, but they don't use blue book values, they use a different value, an MMR value. Uh, but we looked at whether the auctioneers that get a lot of, probably a good conversion rate also have high sales, and the answer is yes, they are correlated. So those auctioneers that are selling a lot of cars are also conditional on selling, getting a high price for that car. Um, uh, so, so yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that. There's a few kind of uh, uh, interesting things within that because once you condition on the car being sold, now you've got a different set of cars that you're looking at. So there's some certain things you have to do to, to correct for that kind of truncation, um, uh, which you can kind of explore more if you're interested. But, but yeah, the answer is it looks like these auctioneers are good at, at all of these things, including price. Uh, who had that? Yep, there in the neck. You mentioned that certain sellers are able to request an auctioneer. Are sellers able to identify good auctioneers? Do they request those top four performers? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, uh, so we don't have data on requests. Um, this is something we've thought about doing, we've never done. One could try to kind of try to figure it out to see if certain auctioneers are, are paired with certain sellers more than you would have expected, which suggests that they probably requested them, and see if those auctioneers that are paired frequently are the better auctioneers. Uh, we haven't actually ever ended up doing that, but uh, my guess is the sellers definitely have a sense for who they think the good auctioneers are, and, and probably similar to management would kind of have a, have a good sense of that. So, oh, is this related to that comment? Let me come back to you then. So back there and then right here. Um, I had a very small comment on online format. Did they try keeping the same setup, but replace the actual car with virtual car or hologram? Yeah, they've done a couple of things. One is they have what's called a simulcast system, where uh, they still have the auction running as it is in the various locations, but you can just get online and you see a camera that you can see the car and, and the auctioneer and you can bid from a simulcast. And right now about 10% of their bids are coming from I should be careful like citing these statistics with cameras and things. I think it's 10, anywhere from 8 to 12% of their bids are coming from, uh, from simulcast bidders. Um, so, uh, so, so it is starting to become a more important part, but they still have the live auctioneers, right? And they have started a couple of other things where it's more of just like a Craigslist type place for a wholesale. So you still have to, in order to get on this Craigslist market, you have to log in with a dealer's license. Uh, and so it's a special Craigslist. Um, and, and there, my understanding, at least last time I spoke to someone that seemed like they knew what they were talking about, is that that hasn't really done very well. Um, but they were just starting a new, I just read that they're starting something new that, that might take off, I don't know. Uh, so there's lots of things kind of in the works in that direction. Uh, have you tried to study uh, the effect of a bidder getting hooked on versus not? Because I would think that once a bidder gets hooked on, then it becomes a little bit of an ego issue, and he would end up bidding higher than if he was not hooked at all. Yeah. So the importance of getting the bidder, the bidder, the bidder is hooked uh, onto the auction. Yeah, no, I, I completely buy this into it. I find myself doing this all the time, right? It's, you know, if, yeah, every time, well. I no. feel you lose out, you're losing out, and you've lost the battle a little bit. Because once you've bid, that you're more likely to fit an incremental amount than if you're not. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think this is part of, and they'll talk about that, if it's creating this competitive environment, so it's going quickly, and this ring man, you can see the ring man, right? He was like, you, now you, now you, now you, right? And you don't want to lose, right? Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think that's part of this bitter frenzy. And could you be more okay losing in an online environment where you don't have a face rather than in front of people where you have a face? Yeah, so maybe that's part of what makes this in-person live thing because you, it's hard to kind of get your competitive juices flowing against, uh, you know, Dust Puppy Four, right? Which is the person bidding against you. Like, who care, right? I mean, uh, so that's one thing we thought about though as well is in this online in this auction process, if you set it in an online framework, maybe you should have to have a picture of yourself, right? And every time someone bids, their picture shows up. Right? It's like, <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> right? And it keeps going back and forth. Right? Maybe that's the type of thing that's going to try to you know, stimulate this demand uh, in the same way that these live auctioneers are able to do it. Right? So, I, I, I mean, I think the options are endless here of thinking about how to set up these online auctions so that they work well. Right? And they do the same thing these auctioneers are doing. Yeah? How are these auctioneers getting paid? I always work on
Yeah, it's not very much. So they have a fixed daily wage that they receive, and, and then occasionally they get small um, uh, performance bonuses, but the bonuses are almost always, in, in all cases that we've, uh, that we've heard of, at least at this main auction house, um, are based on not just their own performance, but say their lanes performance, or the entire auction house that day. So we've sat in on these auction, auctioneer meetings that they have right before they go out and start doing the auctions, and they'll say something like, hey, today if we hit a conversion rate of 60%, you all get a, you know, a $200 bonus, or a $50 bonus, I can't remember exactly the scale. Um, but yeah, so, but mostly it's just a fixed wage. Now they could, uh, one reason why they don't move to just you get a, you know, a fixed amount based on every car you sell is again, there's this non-random assignment. So then it, it doesn't seem fair to have an auctioneer that gets a, a, a lenient seller. And so, it's, but one could imagine some agency stuff that could uh, help solve some of that problem. Um, should I take one or two more questions if there are? So I'll, let's, let's do uh, one question and then we'll end it. Yes. Uh, where did you come up with the idea to do this research? Yeah, so as in, as in most things, there's a lot of just kind of randomness in the process. Um, the, my co-author Justin Sidner and, and Nico Lesetra, they were at Case Western Reserve and they had a colleague who I think worked at Mannheim at the time. And, and he told them that Mannheim was looking for academics to play with their data. Um, and that they were willing to share this, like, these millions and millions of observations and even provide some funding if needed to work with the data. And Justin and Nico kind of jumped to that and said, eh, yeah, well, I mean, even just the data, we'll take it. That sounds awesome. <laughs> and so they had the data and then I was good. I mean, I went to school at, at Berkeley with Justin and so we were talking about it a bunch at a couple of conferences, got excited. We first wrote that left digit bias paper and we ran, we did a couple of other explorations, but pretty soon these auctioneers just jumped out to us as something that just was obviously needing to be studied. Um, and this is partly from just going to these, you know, going to an auction and seeing what happens. Uh, so yeah, that's got, what got me excited. Um, all right, well thank you, it's been great. This is uh, really great. <laughs>